I'll start in like 15 seconds or something. Okay, welcome everybody to my talk. My name is Max Meischein and I'm very happy to present to you a bit about what I learned about SQL in the last year. The first question about this talk is, will this talk help me? Well, hopefully you already know some SQL and are interested in learning a bit more SQL. What I'm going to be showing you will be usable from Perl, but it's not limited to Perl because it's very much about SQL and there are many, th uh, many places where you can use SQL from within Perl or on the command line or wherever. So there are two things I want to show you today. This is um, one, th one topic are the SQL window functions and the other thing are the common table expressions. Um, yeah, two very interesting tools to use in SQL to make your queries easier to read or to do things that you can't otherwise do at all. My name is Max Meischein. I work for the DZ Bank in Frankfurt, the Deutsche Zentralgenossenschaftsbank. It's the central institute of the cooperative banks in Germany. Most likely you haven't heard of it, but um, yeah, if you are a bank with a cooperative bank in Germany, we are the institute behind the Volksbank or Raiffeisenbank. And I work there as a data scientist, which means a little bit of programming, some of which I do in Perl, and a lot of data managing with SQL or maybe with Perl or with Excel, depending on yeah, what is exactly needed. And I'm also a member of the board of Frankfurt PM, the Frankfurt Perl Mongers, and yeah, we events like the German Pearl Workshop and um, yeah, other Pearl events in Germany and Frankfurt, obviously. Now, what I'm going to be showing you is basically available in every modern SQL database. You can use the common table expressions and window functions in Postgres since at least version 9.1. Um, with SAP IQ, formerly Sybase IQ and Oracle also support them. SQL Server 2008 also supports them. And SQLite supports common table expressions since version 3.8. This is important to you if you are an Android developer because version 3.8 was um, delivered, included in the API version 21, which is KitKat, I believe. Um, so yeah, if you are going to deploy on Android and want to use the included SQLite library, you need to take care if you are using common table expressions that you have the correct version. And window functions are only in SQLite 3.25, and that is not deployed on Android at all. So you have to bring your own there. And even MySQL 8 and MariahDB support common table expressions and window functions. So basically, yeah, if you are not using SQLite and if you are using a recent version, you can use this everywhere. Um, yeah, I like to have a toy example on which I uh, build my, my 
uh, talks and most of the time I also like my toy examples to be useful to me personally. So I wrote myself, or I'm still writing myself, a private price tracker, much like the website guidesalts.de. They are a big price comparison site and scrape lots of websites for prices for various things. Um, but yeah, I'm doing the scraping myself because yeah, if I'm watching for some clothing or stuff that I regularly buy, then yeah, I want to be notified if the price is reduced because if it's some item that I use every month or whatever, I don't care if I buy three too many just to have them in stock when I am going to use them. So yeah, the price tracker scrapes various websites and it should send me an email when the price of some item moves in any direction or in my case mostly I'm interested if the price is lower. So how does so, uh, the scraper or the, the process work in general? Well, first I scrape the website, then I store that HTML page somewhere and then I extract the values from that HTML and store these values in the database. And then I want to compare these values and send me an email. That's what I want to do. And the modules I use for that are basically Modulicious and Minion for scraping and um, storing of the HTTP queries well, of the HTML pages resulting from these queries is in a module that I haven't released and the name is not really great, HTTP crawl store. I'm somewhat torn, well, Dexim proposed the name of HTTP archive, which also isn't bad, but yeah, I, I haven't brought the module up for release yet. And yeah, then extracting the values is done using HTML pre-builder libxml and dbd sqlite is my database because it's a single user program and yeah, I don't need a real database server for that little data that I'm processing here. Um, yeah, and then comparing the values and notification is basically done by running an SQL statement against the database and if there are any rows in it, just send the rows in that result by mail to me. It's not fancy, but it works well enough. And yeah, in this talk, I want to talk about how I store the values and then, of course, how I can compare the values to find which prices have changed and how much did they change and So, yeah, as I already said, I'm going to mostly focus on the SQL here. I could have done all of this without a database or at least without any complex SQL and done the logic all in Perl. But, yeah, I like to mix the things up and uh, keep myself entertained, not always do pure Perl. And also, at the time that I started writing this incarnation of the price tracker, SQLite 3.25 was just, had just been released and was available in DBD SQLite 1.62. This is, I think, one or two releases already out. So, yeah, I wanted to use those new features myself. So, yeah. First, I want to tell you a bit about how I actually store the data. Um, there's a great quote by Niklaus Wirt. Um, Show me your flowcharts and conceal your tables and I, I'll continue to be mystified. Show me your tables and I won't usually need your flowcharts. They'll be obvious. So I hope that works and I'm going, 
to show you my tables in which I store the information. I'm storing the extracted information in a table named prices. And it is mostly the item ID here, a white shirt, the date when the information was retrieved, like here, beginning of the year 2019, and some price, 10 euro, 11 euro, 5 euro, for example. Um, I also store some other columns that are of interest for later processing, but not for the, the price calculations, like the URL where I fetched the information from and the item group, like if I have two kinds of white shirts on two different websites, I may want to throw them into the same category of white shirt, even though they are different items. So yeah, it's for binning together, or maybe I'm interested in a colored shirt, but I don't care if it's red or blue, something like that. Um, so yeah, these three columns are the important columns, item, retrieved, and, and price. And I'm using that table prices as an append-only data structure, like a log file, except it's an SQL database table, uh, and I want to only append data to it during normal op uh, operation, so I'm not going to issue update statements or delete statements to it. Delete statements are reserved for that case when maybe my HTML parsing goes wrong, <laughs> then I throw out the old bad data and load back in the new corrected data, but um, otherwise, why would I need to delete data? Um, this means I can travel in time because I can limit my results to, say, the data retrieved last week or only the data until last week. And I can test my programs against the, the old data and then see that my programs react just as I want when they see the new data also in the table. And yeah, basically I can also rewrite history because I can insert older data if I find somewhere older price data or whatever. Um, and also fixing mistakes, it's much, much easier if you can just go back in time virtually and change the rows that were wrong um, instead of yeah, having only the current state of the world in your database. So yeah, having the, the whole complete history available makes things much easier for me in testing and, and data managing. Um, gonna, yeah, let's look at the Perl side of things. Basically, the only Perl statement I use is from the DBI module, select all array ref, and then I fetch all the rows as hashes. So yeah, that's basically all I do. From the Perl side of things, I get back an array of locked hashes and I use a module by me, dbix run SQL for output of these hashes as a nice table. But any kind of SQL running thing does it because all the logic lives in the SQL statement and not in Perl code that um, yeah, talks to the database. So now let us look at what actually is a price change. We have a different date, like here the 4th of January and the 5th of January, and between those, those dates we get a different price from 10 euros to 11 euros. And yeah, the price change is obviously the difference between that 10 and that 11. In our case, it's a change of plus one euro. So the price went up between uh, or in that one day. And to get at that price difference, at least with our eyes, 
we want to loop one row up to get the previous price and for the current row we have the act, uh, current price in the column price. So yeah, we want to look one row up. So we select <coughs> that and now I want to add a new column, at least in my result, um, that contains the change between each two adjacent rows. That means I want for the first row, I want null because there is no previous price, so a change doesn't make sense. And for the second row, I want 11 minus 10 as the result. And for the third row, I want 5 minus 11 as the, the result. So yeah, one day later or two days later, but in the next result, the price dropped by 6 euros already. So yeah, how can we do that, that um, with SQL? We don't, or with, with traditional SQL, we don't get random access to the result set. We only get access within the row that is currently calculated. I mean, that's at least half of the problem. We have the 11 that we want to subtract and we have the five that we want to subtract from, but we also need that value one row up. And how can we get at this? Oh yeah, this is called projection in SQL speak. And to get at values from one row up or one row downwards, we can use the window functions these allow us to basically, basically go one or many rows upwards or downwards in our result set and fetch information and calculate new, new results using them. Very much like going up or down a cell in Excel. And yeah, if we use those, then we can actually get exactly what we want, five, from here and 11 from one row above that row to calculate our results. Okay, and this is the syntax of how a column is calculated using a window function. First of all, we have the name of the window function in this Syntax example, it's fn, but we will see a real window function on the next slide. And together with that function call, <coughs> we have the window over which we want that calculation to happen. And there we have two clauses within that window definition. The partition by clause that defines the window borders whenever a new window should start. And the order by column, uh, the order by clause for this window, this is the order of the rows just for this window. So it is basically identical to the normal order by column of the complete SQL statement, but you can also have a different order for a window function, different from the main order by clause in your SQL result set. So the, the first and foremost, or the, the most interesting function in our context is the leg function. It takes two parameters, the column name and the count, and it gives us the value of the column call name that is count rows above the current row. So using that leg fun function, we can walk upwards in the result set and fetch whatever value we want. And yeah, if we use the function leg price one, we get that value from the column price one, colo uh, one row above us. So if we want to select that value, we write select leg price comma one over and now 
we need to define over which window. And for that example, we want to partition by item because every new item should be in a new window. And we want to order all those rows by the retrieved date. So we go upwards one row in the order um, that we retrieve the data so we know the exact previous price for our current row. And yeah, if we run that, the result is exactly as we want. For the first row, the 4th of January, <coughs> we get now. For the 5th of January, we get 10, which is the price from the 4th of January. And for the 7th of January, we get 11, which is the price of the 5th of January. So that's already great. Ah, yeah, there is also is animated. Um, and yeah, here again, the order by clause. I want to order by retrieved. Um, for this window, I could have several prices maybe ordered by different criteria in different windows, if that makes sense for something. Um, yeah, and together with the lag function is the lead goes the lead function, which is basically the lag function, but in the opposite direction. So it goes rows downward and pulls up values from below the current row. Like this, the first row would get the value 11, the second row would get the value 5, and the last row would get a value of null because there is no row be below the last row. So, yeah, and obviously the lead function could also be written in terms of the lag functions because lead call name count is identical to lag call name and minus count because if you go minus three rows upwards, you're actually going downwards or so the logic goes. So yeah, Be, uh, beyond lead and lag, there are more interesting aggregate, aggregate functions you can use in window function uh, or in windows, like the min, max, sum, and average function. So you can also easily calculate, say, the average price for each item in the last week or within any kind of window. Or, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if a sum makes sense, at least in my example, but maybe you can find other situations where sum makes sense. And you can also uh, use the count function, which is an interesting thing. For example, with the prices database, the count over a window would be the number of prices that are actually available for this window. So you can use that. And very important are the rank and dense rank functions, which give us the number of the current row in our result set. So that way we can actually get the f or know if we are in the first row because the rank function will be one at that uh, row. Or yeah, maybe also we can know if we are in a, an even or odd row because the right rank function will be even or odd. And yeah. Let's look a bit closer at the, the partition by clause because it leads to interesting errors or it led me to an interesting error. The task is I want to find the latest price for each item. And for that I select from the prices database all prices in 2019. And I also select the rank function as position 
and I use rank over a window order by retrieved descending, so I'm getting the newest price in the first row for the rank function. And yeah, the, this is what we get. I have a white shirt and prices from the 4th of January to the 11th of January, and the rank function goes from 4 to 3 to 1, two to one and the last row has the rank function 1. So, yeah, we ordered by retrieved descending, that's great. Ah, yeah, okay. Um, but things go badly as soon as you have more than one item because now I have the white shirt on the 11th of January with a position of 1. That's okay. But I don't have the position 1 for the black shirt. So that's not great, actually. And I have two positions, two for the black shirt and the white shirt which is also not great, and also two positions for this. Yeah, uh, this result does not make sense. Why does it not make sense? Because I forgot to partition my query or my window by item. For each item, I need to open a new window so that the numbering of the uh, rows starts from one again. And as soon as I use the correct partition, uh, clause, then I also get the correct results. That is a nice separation between the black shirts and the white shirts. And the black shirt starts at 3, goes to 2, goes to 1, which is great. And the white shirt starts at 4 and also ends at 1, each with the most current price date that is available. So, to get back to the original problem, uh, ah, okay, no. Uh, you see, in the main SQL clause, I order by item and the retrieve date. So, first is item ascending and then the retrieve date. So, the newest prices are at the end of the table. But the rank function actually sorts the things in the other direction, because I can use a different sort criteria or order by criteria for each window, and it does not need to have anything to do with the outer order by clause, which is used for presenting the results to the user. Yeah, now that we have those two rows in our result set, we just need to filter for position is 1, and then we are done. We have the current, uh, the most current price for each item in our result set. So we just add the clause end pause equals 1, and we get an error. Unknown column pause. Why is it if we add a column here that we cannot use it in the WHERE clause. It is because the window of, uh, uh, the WHERE clause basically executes long, a long time before the Windows functions execute. And SQL does not allow us to yeah, use the, where func uh, the window functions in a WHERE clause. Basically, the order is first the WHERE clause, then the group, bra group by aggregation, then the having clause, which is basically a where clause except for group by columns, and after those, the window functions come. So, yeah, we have the right value, but we cannot filter on it. But we can solve any problem by adding one more layer of indirection. So we take the SQL we have, <coughs> wrap it as a subselect 
in one more select statement and in that select statement we have pause available as a normal column and then we can filter on it. That's not totally elegant but at least it works and we get just those two lines in our result set with the current price and um, yeah. So yeah, that was the quick overview of SQL window functions. They allow us access to values of other rows in the result set. And yeah, below or before the current row or after the current row using the lag function or lead function. And also to result set metadata like the number of total number of rows or the current number, uh, the number of the current row. Um, yeah, and something I did not show you, you can also limit a window size to a fixed size like the previous five rows according to some criteria or the next five rows. Um, this doesn't make sense for my price scraper because, well, maybe it crashes or the website changes or whatever, so I can't, cannot count on having price data available in a continuous manner. Yes, a question. The performance penalty for using window functions, I not sure. There is at least a performance penalty because the ordering and stuff has to happen. So if you don't have an index that covers uh, the ordering, um, you will have to pay one. But my data sets with which I have been using these are relatively small compared to the RAM of the machine. I haven't noticed a bad slowdown just because I added a window function. But they are certainly not free. But all the other solutions like self-joining a table or something do have a cost as well. So uh, I haven't done any benchmarks. But yeah, they don't seem egregiously expensive to me. Yeah, so let's look at the second part of the talk, common table expressions. Um, let's say I want to look again at my price data and I want to find all products which have prices within the last week. And also all the products that didn't have a price last week, maybe because my scraper is broken and does not extract the data anymore or whatever. Finding all products is easy. Select distinct item from prices. And finding all prices within the last week is also easy. Select item price and retrieve date from prices where retrieved is larger than start of 2019, for example. But how can I in a convenient way combine these two queries into one without having to rethink what I'm doing. I could use, for example, temporary tables or views to join these, uh, these two queries together. But I find temporary tables and views very inconvenient. I always have to check or retrace, did I actually execute all the steps to load my temporary tables? Or while developing, did I run my test suite with the current version of the view? Did I really drop it before recreating everything? So yeah, I get this mixed up all the time. Or I could do it via subselects. You've already seen a subselect in the workaround example, but doing subselects 
creates an ugly mess of your SQL. If you are joining two subselects together, you have the one subselect, the second subselect, and around this, above the columns you want, and below some more logic. That's really hard to read if you don't already know what that series of subselects is actually doing. But common table expressions allow us to name subselects and give them column names and everything. So if we have some select, we can give that result a name, like with my name, column name one, column name two, as, and then some random select statement. And then we can, in our main se uh, select statement, just select from that new name as if it were a table. So, yeah, basically you can think of it as an inline view or maybe a temporary table that is created first and then you select from it. And, yeah, using a common table expression, we can use our first select for the distinct, uh, for all the products and give it the name products with products and we only have one column, let's name it item uh, with products as select distinct item from prices and then the other select where we select the latest price we have and we can name that subselect last week and, yeah, with those we can then select the item, the, the retrieve date, and the price from product P, let join last cell, as if they were just plain table. And I find this way of structuring my SQL much cleaner than, yeah keeping those two select statements in inline subselect. So, yeah. Basically, common table expressions are like inline views. They can make your SQL a bit more modular because, yeah, you have logical steps where you declare how your inter intermediate result set should look and you can eliminate temporary tables with them. You don't have the drawbacks of views like needing to separately create them and then drop them again during development, but you also get, don't get any benefits of views like, yeah, you cannot reuse such a common table expression in another select statement. You have to copy the string in pub or use that CTE as a pulse string when generating your SQL if you are doing something like that. Um, yeah, and the common table expressions allow for separate group by statements, uh, group by clauses, which is also convenient yeah, if you want some distinct or group. Marine. Uh, The question is, or the remark is, views are updatable. Um, and the question is, are common table expressions updatable? I think not, but I don't know it. That would be a drawback if you are using, for example, views for access restrictions or anything. You can basically create a reduced view of a table that can still be edited by a user. Um, well, the values in that view can still be edited, and I don't believe that common table expressions are updatable, but I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, we already had one question about performance. In Postgres, common table expression used to be a hard optimization barrier that is no 
item from the outer wear clause however found its way into the common table expression. That means basically if you did not have any wear clause in your common table expression inside, you would always get a full table scan to create the data for the common table expression first and only afterwards the um, optimizations for the wear clause would take hold. This has changed, I believe, in nine dot uh, no, in, in Postgres eleven. But I, I haven't followed it. Followed it that close. For SQLite, uh, common table is expressions create an identical query plan to subselects. So it's basically just syntactic sugar there. And for SAP IQ, the other database I can test with, it was uh, inconclusive what actually happened there. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not the master of interpreting query plans of that DB. Um, both approaches were fast and but different. Yeah. Okay, I think my talk should go until 15 past, no, 5 past. So um, there is one topic that I skipped over. You can also create recursive, recursive common table expressions. I'm going to speed a bit up. Like, for example, if we have a forum thread and um, we link the poll, we have the parent ID of zero for every root thread of the forum and yes, every reply ha gets in the parent the ID of the parent. So basically we model a tree as a table and link or stitch the tree back together by taking each, each child and linking it to each parent through that parent column. If we want to fetch that again, um, we can do that with a recursive SQL. Well, let's first, uh, with a recursive CTE, let's first um, build the normal CTE for the root post. Let's call our CTE reply tree. And yeah, we can select everything from the posts table and zero as the level where the parent column has the value null. So these are all the top posts. And if we add the recursive keyword, we can actually use the reply tree CTE from within itself. This is quite great because now we can fetch all the posts in the order that we want to display, maybe on an HTML page or whatever, with replies exactly below the parent post they are replying. <laughs> this, yeah. And yeah, if we run the SQL, we oops, actually see that, yeah, um, all replies to post one are here and the replies to post three are also in order. So yeah, we can re reconstruct that tree in one single SQL statement. Yes, that's it. Are there questions? Mallory. Give us an idea about how large were the tables that you were running these queries on as far as rooms. <coughs> How large are the tables I'm using this on at home? Maybe 5,000 rows or something. So really small at work where I can use SAP IQ. And maybe 5 million or 50 million, something in that range. Yeah. That's about the, the range, but this was with a SAP IQ is a reporting database that is geared for really fast select statements 
and really slow insert statements. So yeah, I don't uh, expect performance-wise or um, yeah, uh, the, the five million or 50 million rows are not taxing Sybase IQ, so yeah. Other questions, I think? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Here they have one base table. Ah, okay. This just in common table expressions can be updatable if they yeah, basically are constructed from one base table. They can even be updatable, which is great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, no more questions. Thank you very much.